Yeah. Well, I know people are uh, are waiting. I mean, they're getting coffee and stuff. So why don't we start, and then um, we can um, get going. You know, uh, if Pat's uh, it's kind of has an impressive uh, resume from his uh, history of education. He got his doctorate at Florian Florian University in Rome. Now that's a start right there. And he's written a bunch of books and uh, articles, and uh, he's a professor at Gonzaga University, as several of our uh, uh, participants are here, have been. And uh, one of his titles of his book I just love is called A Banquet. Banqueter's Guide to the All Night Soup Kitchen of the Kingdom of God. <laughs> so that gives you a sense of who he is. And we're delighted that you came. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I'm, I think the nicest thing you can say about me is that you asked me that. That's, <laughs> that's, that's really, I, that's the thing I'm most Always. tickled at. Well, thank you. Okay. So we're going to do a big topic today. Um, and the big topic is meritocracy. And we're going to take a look at it and... Um, and I'm going to suggest uh, what, uh, what some of the harms and the dangers of it are. Uh, and I'm going to suggest um, how it might uh, conflict with some of our um, uh, basic uh, biblical or Christian intuitions. And then uh, I'm going to suggest um, some, some possible uh, uh, ways to address it. But first, I want to explore what it is. Okay. So, um, I'm going to suggest that uh, for the last half of a century, um, this thing that I'm going to call meritocracy, and I'm not the only one calling it that, this thing that I'm going to call meritocracy has basically uh, shrunken our middle class in the United States, and that it's created a growing chasm uh, between uh, the shrinking middle class and uh, uh, a, a group of poor people who are skyrocketing away from and I'm going to suggest that that gap, that inequality between the middle class and the rich, or the gap between the rich and the rest, is posing a very real threat to our democratic society. And then showing up not just in business, but in politics as well. And, um, and then I'm going to ask um, what our faith and our commitment to a just and peaceful society tell us about the dangers of this meritocracy. Okay. So um, here's, here's the, uh, the short version, okay? So you, you sit down with your friends uh, later today, and, you, and they say, well, why did you stay an hour after church today? And you tell, this is what you can tell them, okay? In the last 50 years, there's been a growing divide between the middle class and the rich in the United States. And that divide has created two separate and unequal societies. And one of the consequences of that is that these two groups are not speaking to one another. And the middle class, feeling shamed and enraged by its loss of power, has turned to populist and nativist politicians who have promised them that they could bring back the America of the past without actually bringing any structures into place that would accomplish that. Whereas um, traditional politicians have continued to offer us the idea that there's a bridge out of um, a shrinking middle class towards uh, more success and wealth if we get a great education and great jobs for our children. But they're not dealing with the fact that that bridge is getting narrower every year and that rungs on the ladder are disappearing. So we're being fed um, misinformation from both the right and the left on this uh, particular problem because neither of them wants to address the underlying problem which is the growing economic divide which is happening in our country. The good news is that we have had economic divides in the past and that is at the end of the 19th century we had the Gilded Age which created a great gap between the super rich, like the Carnegies, uh, and the rest of society. And we had a great economic divide 
at the in, in the 1930s, at the end of the 1920s and the 1930s, um, that uh, created again uh, an economic divide between the middle class and the poor. And America has been able to overcome those divides in both situations. And in the most recent uh, situation, uh, from the 1930s to the 1970s, decisions that were made uh, in our country uh, in the um, New Deal and the War on Poverty created what historians call the Great Compression. And that Great Compression built a huge middle class that had tremendous political and economic power and cut the rate of poverty in this country by one half in 40 years. So it's not that we can't do this. We've done this before. Some would argue we've done it before twice in the last 100 years. So it is a possible thing for us to turn around. But it won't be easy. And it would require us to be able to sit down and have conversations across the left and right and tell both our politicians on the left and right that you have got to quit ignoring um, the bear in the middle of the room, which is the economic divide. And as long as we think that the solution is rounding up all of the Mexicans and driving them out of the country, or the solution is getting all of our kids into the best schools, these solutions from the left or from the right or the left are not addressing the underlying problem. And the underlying problem has to be addressed, and if it's not, then the left and the right are going to continue not to talk to one another about these issues. Okay? So if you're on the left, you can be deeply angry with nativist and populist solutions, and I'm very sympathetic with you on that. But we must also be aware of the fact that our center-left and center-right politicians who are telling us that we just need um, to work harder and uh, and to get our kids into good schools, and that that's the path out, are ignoring the fact that there used to be a wide-based path um, available to Americans that's been shrinking for the last 40 years. And unless we figure out a way to broaden that central path and quit focusing on an increasingly narrow path, we're going to be mistaken. Okay, so. Obviously, that wasn't a two-minute speech, but it is a general sound. Okay, so it gives you the general idea. And when you when you fall asleep in about 40 minutes and you wake up and you ask yourself, well, where is he? Well, you should know where I was going. Okay, so that's the problem. All right, we go on. Okay, so Ben Franklin famously said around the time of the Revolutionary War, if we do not hang together, we shall certainly hang separately. Okay. Um, there's going to be copies of this PowerPoint, so you can uh, anybody can get access to it. Now, what I'm going to talk about is the academic, the economic chasm beneath our political divide and the underlying shared faith in meritocracy. So, Franklin's quote means that you and I need to work together with those with whom we deeply disagree if we're to protect the common good and preserve our democracy. And that is. We're going to have to move beyond the solution of we have to beat the other guy. We have to make sure that only our people get into office. It's not going to happen. The other team's not going away. Okay, so we need to abandon that as a solution. Right? In the 1940s, um, U.S. Congress was criticized by some political scientists because there was not enough difference between Republicans and Democrats for voters to be able to identify which ones they wanted. Well, Newt Gingrich solved that problem for us, okay? <laughs> and so now um, we hate each other so much that we won't sit down at Thanksgiving dinner with one another. So the, the first place we're going to have to recognize is for a democracy to work, we're never going to be able to ship 38% of our population off to an island. That's not going to happen. They can't ship us, and we can't ship them. So um, this shared labor right now of making Congress work, uh, or, or making our state assemblies work, seems impossible because political polarization divides us into opposing camps who demonize each other, lock her up, lock him up, um, who don't believe in the same reality. January 6th was a tourist day, January 6th was a revolution. Cannot talk to one another. I'm not 
having her marry one of those people, and seem increasingly attracted to authoritarian leadership. And I want to point this out also both to the left and the right. You know, people on the left and, and progressives are very critical of people on the right for being seduced by populist politicians who want to exercise authoritarian leadership. But let's be honest, a lot of the stuff that Barack Obama and Joe Biden have been doing because they can't get Congress to work have been through executive orders. So now, now neither Biden nor uh, Obama have used executive orders as often as the president between them, but they they both use them uh, significantly. So and and so when they do that, you know, many uh, progressives say, well, they didn't have any other solution, so that's good. But what just happened this week in France is instructive here. Macron is on the progressive left. And he just decided to raise Social Security by two years without a vote in Parliament. Now, that may have been the right or correct decision. The economics may be behind him on that. But he did effectively say, we're not going to vote on this. And that is a move towards an authoritarian solution to problems. And that is, when we lose faith in our ability to have conversations with people with whom we deeply disagree, then Superman or Batman looks good to us, all right? Somebody who will come in and through force be able to solve problems for us. And that's a problem. Now, what I'm going to suggest today is that a big reason for this uncivil divide is that for the last 50 years, there's been a growing economic divide between the rich and the rest, which is turning us into two separate and unequal nations without experience, understanding, or compassion for one another. And that our shared faith in a meritocratic society where the spoils should go to those bringing the most talent and effort to the table has been, a, if not the primary, I'm going to say at least a primary source for this undemocratic and dangerous divide. Now, here's the irony. Both the left and the right believe in meritocracy. Okay? And that is... Even people who think the system is broke, who think that they want to bring back America you know, to what it used to be, even those people who make that argument, uh, even the people who are raging against uh, the, the elites in the present situation, and that is the shrinking and failing middle class in America who are voting for populist candidates, they deeply believe that hard work and training are the key to success and that um, that taking assistance from the government is a sign of weakness and nobody ought to do it. Now, this, is, this, this belief that Americans have, we have it across the spectrum. I just heard a story on NPR this morning uh, about a sociologist who's written a book about poverty in America, and he reports that one in five uh, people on uh, welfare don't actually collect it. Okay? And that is, we don't have a problem of welfare dependency in America. We have a, a, depend we have a problem of welfare withdrawal. And that is, even the poor think that it's shameful to take assistance from the government. And, and, and the working class and the middle class have a deep belief in the fact that work, hard work and education will get, will solve your problems. All right? And that belief is deeply shared also by the rich and the elites. And the result of that shared belief in meritocracy, uh, I'm going to suggest, is the problem. And that is, if we could all agree to disagree on this one point, we might actually be able to solve it. It's our shared faith, our unshakable, and as a biblical person, I would say, our idolatrous faith in this practice. Our idolatrous faith. And this is a unique faith. And that is, if you look at other developed democracies around the world, they do not have as deep a conviction as Americans have that hard work and education will solve your problems for you. They have an awareness that they live in communities and that sometimes they need assistance from others and that they need to share their wealth. That is, so our faith in meritocracy is, is uniquely and deeply American, and I want to suggest it's problematic. And if we are willing to look at that faith, then we might be able to unpack this problem. Okay. All right. 
So what's been happening? All right. So between the 1930s and the 1970s, FDR's New Deal, the post-war expansion, and LBJ's war on poverty saw a massive growth and dominance of the middle class, right? A reduction of economic inequality, dividing the poor and the middle class, and a shrinkage of, ranks of, uh, uh, of the ranks and depths of poverty, cutting the U.S. poverty rate in half. So that the middle class in the United States between the 1930s and the 1970s began, um, came to dominate American economics, business, politics, culture, and, and, and society. That is, um, the difference between the middle class and um, the rich was um, shrunk significantly during this period. So much so that the rich tended to, buy, uh, to, to live in neighborhoods either very close to or uh, in the same neighborhoods as the middle class. The people who ran corporations and companies made uh, significantly more money than the people who were in middle management, but they didn't make uh, they did not make 60 to 200 times as much of that money, and they tended they tended to uh, they tended to drive just different versions of the same cars, and that is that they they bought the high end Fords and the high end General Motors uh, and the high end Chevrolets, but they they did not buy Lamborghinis, right? Um, and so they they lived in more proximate uh, communities. And so you were more likely, if you were in the middle class, to belong to the same church, to the same golf club, um, to the same business organizations, and to live in the same neighborhoods as some of the wealthiest people in your community. Right? Um, and so this great compression meant that the middle class uh, had uh, great power uh, in the middle of the 20th century. Right? Um, they also did most of the work in business, and that is middle management in most corporations and businesses and law practices and, med and medicine, middle management were the people who did most of the work. And um, the people who owned the banks or the people who ran the companies uh, worked significantly shorter week hours, okay? Um, they, uh, they did much less of the actual running of the corporation, and they had a much thinner understanding of what was going on in the, on the ground. And so in banks, your bank loan officers, your middle management people were the people who had a thick understanding of how the business ran. And their pay reflected their, their relatively rich understanding. The same thing was true of law firms. The same thing was true in retail. The same thing was true uh, across the board. Okay, so the middle class dominated uh, during this period, right? Um, also, what happened as a result of the New Deal and the, um, the post-war expansion and the war on poverty was that we continue to have a poverty rate in this country, which is an embarrassment of, of, of 10 or 11 percent. One out of 10 people living in this country ought not to be living in poverty, and there are bad and serious reasons why this is going on, and it has a terrible effect not just on that 10 percent, but on lots of other people in our society. But we were able to cut that rate in half by making policy changes in various levels in our community. There are things we were able to do in that 40-year period that radically cut um, the extent of poverty in our country. So something happened, and it wasn't a fluke, and it wasn't an act of God, and it didn't happen from nature. We, the people, did it. So if we did it once, we could do it again. Now, since the mid-1970s, our richest 10, 1, and 0.1% have rocketed away from the middle class, creating the greatest economic inequality and divide of any developed country. No other nation that's a developed nation has this kind of a gap. And, and um, so I'm going to talk about education love, uh, later. But basically, the gap between the middle class education and rich education in the United States is equal to the gap between um, rich uh, education and middle class education in Tunisia. Yeah. So we're, we're on the yellow brick road to the third world. That's, so that's, that's me. So since the mid-1970s, our richest uh, top 
have rocketed away. They've created the greatest economic inequality and divide of any developed democracy. Nobody else looks like us. All right. The U.S. gap between the rich and the rest now equals the Jim Crow gap between white and black Americans. So the gap between being a black citizen in this country in the 1930s and a white citizen is now what it's like to the gap between the middle class and the wealthy. It equals the gap of the pre-1970s gap between uh, women, men and women in our society, the pay gap, and it exceeds the mid-century gap between America's poor and America's middle class. So in the 1950s, the gap between America's poor and America's middle class was the gap that um, LBJ and uh, mid-century politicians wanted to address, right? Well, we now have a gap between the middle class and the, um, and the rich that um, exceeds that. Now, here's one of the thoughts that you may be having. Really, why is this a problem? I mean, the middle class has enough. So, a couple of these loonies who run TikTok and other kinds of things, so they have gazillions of dollars. What kind of a difference does it make? We're going to see that there is a real and substantial and important answer to that question. Okay. Okay. So, um, so this gap has grown. All right. And um, and uh, in business, medicine, law, finance, and management, the gap between the median and the highest earners has grown. So between those mid-level bank managers, right, and the people who own the banks used to be, uh, you know, a certain amount, it has multiplied either by four or 10 or 20 fold since the 1960s, okay? So, so maybe you, you worked in, your father worked in that bank, or you, and, and he was a mid-level manager, all right, in that bank, or he worked for a corporation like IBM or Kodak, all right, uh, and, and he had a mid-level management position, and there was, there, was a, there was somebody at the top who was the CEO, the gap between them now is four or 10 or 20 times what it used to be. They don't need another planet to do the mining on. They need another planet for housing for them because they live on another planet. All right, so uh, the rich and the rest live increasingly, even jarringly, separate and in an unequal world. Okay, so what's making this happen? All right. I'm going to suggest today that there are two primary engines driving the meritocracy gap. Okay? One of them is education, and one of them is employment. Nice, two E's, right? Okay, so one of them is education. All right, America's unique and escalating gap is driven and perpetuated primarily by a growing divide in both education and employment of the rich and the rest. <laughs> The staggering and climbing economic inequality between America's rich and the rest is largely down to the fact that the nation's wealthy elite <coughs> go to very different schools and labor in very different workplaces. Now, again, you may be thinking throughout this presentation, Pat, what about the poor? Okay, here's my caveat. I'm not going to be addressing the poor today. The problem of poverty in America is a really serious problem, and it deserves really serious attention. And I'm not going to address that today. I'm going to address this gap, and I'm going to suggest that this gap is also serious, and it poses a real threat to our democracy. I don't, it doesn't mean that I don't care about the poverty issue. I'm also not going to primarily address race, and I'm not going to address gender. It's not that these are not incredibly important issues. They are. But today, we're just going to focus on this gap. Right? And I'm not saying it's more important than the others, but I am saying it's really important. In a new system of meritocracy dominating our schools and our workplaces, the rich and their children are being progressively separated out from the middle class and the poor and funneled into vastly superior education and employment tracks that enable them to establish and hand on dynasties of elite incomes, wealth, privilege, and status. Okay, here's the thing. I bet that everybody in this room believes that if you work harder, and if you've got talent, that you should be able to do better than people who don't work as hard and don't have as much talent, okay? That's a pretty embedded belief in us, all right? And, and you can see the attraction of it. So Marty ought to get the promotion because he's worked harder and he's mastered the skills of this job, okay? 
But what if one of the reasons why Marty worked hard was that from the second he was born to two parents with college or post-college degrees, he got a better education the second he left the womb till the time he finished school. And not just a cognitive education. There's evidence that if Marty lived in a rich family, he would have heard, hold on to this, 20 million more words before he was three years of age than a child born in the middle class. And 30 million more words than a child born to parents on welfare. Now, you can't say that's not an edge. Also, if Marty went to uh, a really good kindergarten, um, which is one of the exclusive kindergartens uh, that the, the elites go to, it would have cost his parents $50,000 a year for that kindergarten. And the acceptance rate at that kindergarten would have been lower than the acceptance rate at Harvard which is 5%. So suddenly, Marty's ability, his intelligence, and his hard work look like they're gifts that got given to him because he won the lottery of being born in a wealthy family. And then you say, but Marty's an incredibly nice guy. Studies also indicate that the parents of the wealthy spend one hour a day more reading to and speaking directly with and caring for their children than the parents of the middle class. And by the time that child reaches college, those parents have spent on their own 5,000 hours more with Marty than a child from the middle class. And all indications are that that enriches Marty's emotional intelligence significantly so that he's able to deal with stress and he's able to negotiate difficult situations much better than somebody who didn't get that attention. All of us are aware of the fact that children who don't experience direct attention from their parents in the first 18 months of their life suffer all kinds of negative consequences. We know that our prisons are filled with people who grew up in foster homes and changed those homes 10 or 12 times in the first couple of years. So we have a great deal of compassion for the people who are devastatingly deprived of that attention. But imagine if you got that attention like a fire hose in the first couple of years of your life. So Marty, when we say, well, he's so much more virtuous than the other workers, he's harder working, he's smarter, and he's kinder, yes because he has stood in front of a shower of love, attention, and education in the first three years that the other children never got. So, then I come back to you and say, if we were on a level playing field, it makes sense to me to say that everybody who works harder and is smarter should get the job. But what if the only reason that Marty worked harder and was smarter and was kinder and was more resilient was that he grew up under a fountain of opportunities that showered him. What if the inheritance that Marty's parents gave to him was not $10 million you know, in a bank account, or $10 billion in a bank account, which could have been taxable. What if the inheritance they gave him was that they made him a different person from the moment he came out of the womb? Then, it looks like meritocracy is built on something a little more shaky. And if you play the game of meritocracy for multiple generations, it's like playing Monopoly for several days. Yes, at the beginning, when Harvard and Yale shifted to a meritocratic entry uh, test so that students from the Midwest or from public schools could suddenly get into schools that only kids from rich prep schools got into in the past. Yes, it was great that we had all these really bright kids from um, the Bronx or from Kansas suddenly could go to Harvard and Yale. Yes, that's true. But today, the overwhelming
overwhelming majority of the kids who get into these schools come from zip codes where the income is phenomenally higher than it is for the middle class in this country. So we are playing late stage meritocracy or third day monopoly. And when you play it like that, then, the, then um, so Ernest Hemingway said, how are the, it was asked, how are the rich different from the rest? And he said, they're different because they have more money. But um, Scott Fitzgerald said, uh, the rich are different from the rest. Now, in the mid-19, in the mid-20th century, Hemingway was right. The only difference between the rich and the rest was that they uh, had more money. The difference today is that they have been showered with so many uh, opportunities that have actually changed their brain and emotional structure and their work habits and their lives that they are different. We made them different. Okay. And that making of them different has created a society in which we are not equal. We're having all of this outrageous fight now about it's not fair that somebody who was born a guy should be able to play sports as a girl because he's had an operation. But we're not having any conversations about the fact that the people who take SATs and come from elite neighborhoods score the count. People who take SATs from elite neighborhoods score 390 points higher on the SATs on average than people who come from impoverished neighborhoods, and 250 points higher than people who come from the middle class. The SAT is one of the best indicators of geography in this country. Okay. So, so then, then we really have to ask our, ourselves a question about these two kids look alike, they walk alike, but they're not the same. And they've been made not the same from conception forward. All right, so, um, so education and employment. All right, uh, next. So, okay. so how does education, uh, oh, so we went the other way. So we, so we, yeah, okay, so what happened in the 1960s, um, the Ivy League schools and then um, the elite schools and now all the, uh, all the schools uh, transformed themselves into um, reliance on SATs and, um, and the top schools became highly selective sorting houses with acceptance rates that dropped. So at, in, at, at, in Second World War, Yale accepted 60, 60% of its applicants. Okay? Today, it accepts less than 5% of its applicants, all right? And that's true of Stanford, and that's true of the Ivy Leagues, and it's true of Columbia, and it's true of MIT, and it's true of University of Chicago. So all of a sudden, they went, they become these sorting houses, right? And the reason that that's important is these schools then become the funnels into which people go to the businesses which then have the best jobs. 40 years ago, there was an article um, that, um, in the New York Times that argued that going to a second-tiered school um, or even a good public school in the Midwest only made a difference of about $100,000 over the course of your entire uh, working life, right? So that was the, the difference. I can assure you that that is absolutely not true today. That um, going to a, uh, a uh, mid-level public school uh, in the middle of the United States versus going to an elite school is is uh, is going to make that kind of difference in a, in a couple of years, right? So it's, that's not a difference that you're going to have to wait 40 years to spend that. Right? From birth to grad school, the total resources spent on educating a rich child, hold to this, is about 10 million dollars more than on a poor or middle class child. Okay, so. In poor states in the United States, a child going to a public school has about $8,000 a year spent on it. In a wealthy state like Connecticut, a middle class child has about um, uh, $18,000 spent on them, and a rich child has about $28,000 spent on them. 
This is just going to grade school, all right? In uh, elite school in the United States, uh, a child has about $75,000 a year spent on them, okay? And then the differences multiply uh, when you go to college, right? In the, um, in the bottom 10% of colleges in the United States, a student going to this bottom 10% of colleges, so let's say a community college, a student with her tuition pays for 78% of the cost of her education. Her tuition pays for 78% of the cost of her education. A wealthy student going to Harvard pays for 20% of her education. Now, a good deal of that 80% comes from endowments, right? Where wealthy people give tax deductible uh, donations uh, to the universities. The top 10 uh, universities in the country have a cumulative endowment of $180 billion. And it continues to grow because it's tax-free and it's invested, right? So, um, but what this means is the child going to the community college who is paying 78% of the cost of her education, all right, is also paying taxes. And her and her family are paying the taxes that are being funded uh, from the uh, charitable tax-free uh, uh, exemptions that are being given to the top 10% of the schools to pay for the education at Harvard and at Yale and at the other schools. So she's not just paying for the vast majority of her own education while her colleague is hardly paying fifth of his cost of that education, she's also helping to defray those costs. So this system, this is a, this is a rigged game, all right? And education has a, a piece to do with it, okay? Okay, let me on next. Now, um, the middle class, oh no, we went back again, so we need to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I had problems with that too. Okay, all right, okay. Um, See, this one. His life is okay. Okay, all right. Okay, so, yeah, let's go, let's go past this. Okay. We're looking for the, the education one. I mean, we did the education one. All right. Yeah, beyond this, yes, next, next, next. No, now, now we're going backwards again. That's all right. It's okay. Right, keep going. Keep going. All right, I missed the business one. All right, um, go one back. Can you come one back? Okay, go to, go to the, um, the, the next, the next, yeah, okay, all right. So here's a piece on that's the education, right? So Marty has gotten a great education at home from his two college-educated parents. Then he gets a great education in private kindergartens. Then he gets a great education in very good schools that pay that uh, that uh, cost seventy-five thousand dollars a year. Then he gets a really good education at uh, elite colleges and universities that he could only have gotten into because of these other previous educations. Then he gets a great job. Now, here's the piece about the jobs, right? <clears throat> What's happened in the American economy since the 1950s is the hollowing out of the ladder that takes place in the middle. So, in 1995, the CEO of McDonald's was a man who had started at McDonald's in the 1950s as a fry cook, okay? Uh, McDonald's used to run un uh, McDonald's University where it trained its workers to move up the McDonald's ladder. And he was an example, an extreme example, of that uh, reality. IBM had a, a training program where if you were hired out of school uh, to, at an entry level in IBM, then uh, they trained you for two years, um, and then they would train you for four weeks every year for the next uh, 
40 years. So they, um, they basically, um, they didn't need to hire anybody who was older than 25 because they could bring uh, people along. There was always a rich enough pool in-house, right? So that meant that there were middle rungs in these corporations. This was true also of Kodak, and it was true of most major corporations, and that is that people got training. The other thing that was true was that the, um, that the, uh, um, that the, most of the work was being done by the people in the middle rungs. Now, here's what happened uh, between the 1970s and today. Most of the people who are in leadership positions in business, in economy, in finance, and law today have advanced academic degrees from elite universities. To get into those elite universities, they had to have all the training that we described that Marty got, which meant that when you were competing with Marty to get that job, you didn't have a snowball's chance in July. All right? So, so Marty got the job, except in Spokane. All right, so um, Marty got the job. But once Marty got the job, okay, people like Marty then invented new technologies in finance, in computers, and in law, which allowed Marty to do the work of 10. So Marty at the top, you know, Marty becomes a super, uh, a uh, talented worker and, and getting a super pay. A simple example of this is the bank loan officer that dominated the banking industry in, uh, up until the 1970s. And this was a local person in a local bank. If I went to you to get a loan, you would sit down with me and you would go over my finances with me. You would come and you'd find out about my family and find out about my job and you'd make a decision and make a recommendation to your boss and say, I think Pat McCormick is good for it. Uh, he doesn't have any outstanding debts, he's not a drug addict, uh, he goes to church on a regular basis, whatever. And I was a good guy, and you would make that recommendation. And you made a good living from doing that. The banking industry has changed, and they've developed algorithms which were invented by very smart people like Marty. <laughs> so that then people like Diane could replace about 50 people like you. And she got paid about 25 times what you got paid. And she didn't live in your town. And your bank, along with that of these branches of your bank, then bundled those loans. And it didn't really matter whether the loans were good or bad, because we were going to sell them in a package. We just needed to know that overall, following the algorithm, that we were going to be able to sell these loans and market them. Now, Diane, in order to have that job, she had to have a really advanced degree to be able to operate the technologies that Marty had invented in finance. Same thing was true in law. Same thing was true in computing. So what's happened in the economic sector is that in businesses, there's been a sorting out, uh, a sorting out of jobs to the glossy jobs on top, where many of these people work at a minimum of 60 or 70 hours a week to the gloomy Walmart um, jobs at bottom, where you have to wear a uniform and you're, you're collecting government assistance. And that's been the gap. So, the, so what shrunk here is the people in the middle. And the latter has shrunk, so if you can't go, there aren't any stories about people going from gloomy to glossy jobs here. The only way to get a glossy job is to get an education at one of these really great institutions or schools, right? So education, then, and employment have worked hand in hand so that in a second and third generation of meritocracy, it's not just that they've pulled the moat up behind them and raised the floor, but they've made sure that the only jobs that are available that pay really good money are jobs where people can use technologies that were invented by people who got these educations. And then they send their children to schools where they can get the education, where they can invent ever more complex technologies so that they create a bigger and bigger divide. So they're not just twin engines, okay, but they're twin self-perpetuating engines. And that is, at the end of his career, Marty does two things. 
He hands over to the corporation that he's worked for technologies that will allow the corporation to hire only people, you know, a small group of people at the top and a large group of minions at the bottom, okay? And then in his own family, he has over the last 30 years handed over an inheritance to his own children, a tax-free inheritance, by the way, to his own children, uh, which, which allows them to go to the best schools so that they can get the jobs which he and his cohort have invented. So, on the one hand, we're sympathetic to the idea, well, of course, the smartest and the hardest working people should get the job, okay? Well, let's think about that for a minute. Should they get the job if the job was invented by them to make sure it was a job that only they and theirs could get? And would we be better off in a community where we have one person like Diane, who is doing the work of 50 mid-level bank managers, right? Is that really the most productive way that we, can, um, that we can operate as a community? It turns out that economically, that doesn't actually produce the most wealth in the community. It does produce the most wealth for the people at the top of the community, and it's also not the only way to go. If our educational system was different, and our employment system was different, we could still create great wealth in our society, but we wouldn't concentrate it in one era. How do we know that? Germany is the only other country, the only other advanced democracy, that has, uh, that produces um, uh, a GDP that is about $50,000 a year per person. So they have about a similar kind of wealth. But the wealth is vastly differently distributed in Germany than it is in the United States. And that has a great deal to do with both their laws of employment and their laws of education. So we could make choices. So if, if one of the defenses against meritocracy, or for meritocracy is that, well, this is just natural, this is just the way it has to be. No, it doesn't have to be this way. We could choose other paths. But my basic point here is that education uh, has, uh, and meritocracy in education, has increasingly fed into employment in, and then employment back into education so that they both help to concentrate wealth further and further into a smaller and smaller group of people. Okay. All right, so, um, yeah, I think we got that part. Okay, let's try it. Okay, now, so I'm going to, so, so the harms of this system are, um, yeah, the harms to this system uh, are in three directions. They harm the middle class, they harm uh, the elites. I know we're not going to get a lot of boo hoo about this. Okay? <laughs> but still, they do harm the elites, and uh, they harm our democracy. How do they harm the middle class? Okay. They harm the middle class because since the 1970s, both the ranks and the wealth of the middle class have shrunk by a fifth and a third. Okay, so there are a lot fewer in the middle class, and they have a lot less wealth. Okay, so it's done that. But it's also it's also eliminated their opportunities for climbing the ladder for the so-called American dream. At the present time, it is significantly easier to climb the economic rungs in France and in Finland than it is in the United States. So the American dream uh, it comes with a baguette. Okay, and a beret, but it does not come with a cowboy hat. All right, so the American dream, it is the French dream and not the Kansas dream. So that's that. So um, so there are fewer in the middle class. They're not as well off, and they have less opportunity for growth. They have much less opportunity to hand on that wealth to their children. In fact, the primary way in which wealth is handed on in society at the present time is through educational opportunities. And there's been more um, spending. The spending on education has grown more in the last 50 years than spending in any other sector, which means the rich know exactly where to put their money. And that is, you put your money in education because it's tax-free and it has the greatest reward. Right? So, um, so the middle class finds themselves in that situation. The middle class are also suffering from these depths of despair. About 150,000 uh, Americans are dying every year since about 2006 as a result of um, suicide, opioid, alcohol, uh, and other forms of addiction. 
And uh, this is largely concentrated among uh, white males who have not gone to college. Right? And that is the very people who had uh, union or middle class jobs in the 1950s and the 1960s, all right? because they can read the writing on the wall. So the despair has turned inwards, right? But the despair has also turned outwards because this is the voting block, block for nativist and populist politicians. That is, these are the people who are voting overwhelmingly for politicians who are not offering them solutions to their problems. To be fair, I'm not convinced that the left is offering us solutions either. Nobody who's not addressing this can offer us a solution to it. Um, but they're not offering solutions, but they are communicating that they hear their rage. And it's the hearing of the rage that is drawing the voters. Right? So all of these things are affecting uh, the middle class in very significant ways. But it's also affecting uh, the elites. Again, big boo -boo, Okay, But here's the thing. While it is true that um, the uh, student bodies of Harvard and Yale and uh, the elite schools are overwhelmingly composed of the top quintile of Americans' economy. Um, and, uh, and so being rich is a necessary condition for getting into these schools. It's not a sufficient one. Which means that from birth to, um, to college, these parents are spending all of this extraordinary effort and energy and wealth on getting little Marty into the good schools because they know there's a pretty good chance he won't get there. And that's making them crazy. So, there's, so imagine, yes, it's true, he's being showered with all of this love and all of this other stuff. But he has economically, in the household, turned into a product. He is their most important economic product. And it is like those kids, you know, generations before that we used to hear about, the McEnroe kids, you know, whose dads, like, were so focused on them being great tennis players, or the kids who, you know, whose dads were so obsessed about them being baseball players from childhood. Yeah, they got to go to the Olympics, they got to do all those kinds of things, but they also had a lot of stress. There's a lot of evidence that suggests very high levels of stress and mental illness among this group, in spite of the fact of all of their resilience and um, you know, emotional love, right? A great deal of anxiety is experienced. The work happens. So they work very hard from the time they're in kindergarten uh, and in grade school. They spend much more time on their homework than the middle class children. They spend much more time in programs uh, during the summer. They spend much more time in training uh, in other situations. Uh, they're, so their labor habits are much more intense. Um, and then when they do get these jobs, the elite spend significantly less time on vacation than the middle class. Significantly less. They work many more hours every week. The rich throughout history have been lazy. Okay? They, have, they have lived lives of luxury. But that's because their wealth came from what they owned. Today's rich in America, their wealth comes from their bodies, from their effort, all right? from their billable hours. The majority of wealth of the top 10% in America is not drawn from inherited wealth or property owned. It is drawn from either the direct or the indirect product of their labor. So when they stop working, it stops happening. Right? So there are a number of very uh, negative effects. And a number of people in the elite will often complain that they would love to not have to work 60 or 80 hours a week. You know, um, But of course, the other problem is that the, the, the distance in the rungs at the very top are much greater than the distance at the rungs in the middle or at the bottom. So if you lose a promotion at the very top, you don't just lose $10,000. You lose $5 million. And so the competition and the stress is, again, boo -boo. I, I get that piece. Okay? Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is, it's not actually making them happy either. either right? Now, they're not committing um, suicide at the same rate that the middle class is. But the other injury that they are suffering 
if the middle class is experiencing internal rage that's leading them to depths of despair, and, and externalized rage, which is leading them to scapegoat um, Mexicans and uh, transgender people and, and whoever is different, the children of the elites are also <clears throat> compassion deprived. Now, here's a very interesting thing. You go to any elite university in the United States, or you go to any club of the wealthy in the United States, they're all on the correct side of racism, sexism, homophobia, transgender. They're all on the correct side. They absolutely think that trans people should have their own bathroom. They absolutely think that gay people should be able to marry. They absolutely think that women should be able to have their full range of rights. But when you talk to them about progressive taxation, not so much. So they're Democrat on social issues, but they're overwhelmingly Republican on economic issues. When you talk to them about, about spending money on training or reallocating taxes to improve the education of the middle class or the poor, they're absolutely opposed to it. And there is a direct correlation between the wealth of the school the students attend, or the wealth of their peers, and their level of, or their lack of compassion for the people below them. Why, again, is this true? The people in the middle class and the people among the poor rage against um, the system because they believe, they believe that hard work should get you to success. But if Pat is working very hard and not succeeding, and if he still believes in that truth, then he must believe that he's bad or a failure, and he rages against himself. Or when a politician comes along and says, your job's been stolen by a Mexican, he rages against him. Or that your, your daughter can't win the swimming race because there's a transgender guy in her bathroom, then he rages against him. But, all, but it's all based on the fact that he believes in the system. The Yale kid and the Harvard kid, okay, who's enjoying all of the benefits of the system, is working very hard. That is true. They're not lazy. This is not whoever you voted for. This is not George W. Bush. Okay? These are very smart, very hardworking people. Right? They were very hard to get into that school. It's true they also got into the school because they were very rich, which taught them to work very hard. Right? But they also believe that too. And so when they look over at Pat, over there, failing, they have no compassion for him. They have no sympathy. So both the middle class and the rich are being morally injured by this alienation in, in radically different ways. And if either of them could recognize what the source of the ill was, then this guy, so if I was a peasant, in Russia, 19th century Russia, I would know that I've been screwed economically, not because I wasn't working hard or because the, the, the czar was a better person. I'd know that the game was rigged against me. Okay, And if I was a, a nobleman in France in the time of Marie Antoinette, I would know that I could drink the coffee and have the cupcakes and that <laughs> I was born with the rich and I don't actually deserve it more than it deserves. But so, I'm so happy that this is the way. So, revolutionaries and progressives, until the 1970s, have always had the moral advantage of being able to say, the rich don't have any right to their wealth. But if all of us believe in meritocracy, that argument goes away, and for the middle class, it turns into self-hatred and scapegoating hatred against the outsider, and for the wealthy, it turns into a lack of compassion and a sense of disdain. I point out to you that both Hillary Clinton and Mitt Romney considered the bottom economic half of the country deplorables. Both of them. It's not an accident. Both of them believe that their hard work, sweat, and tears got them to where they are, and these other people, these Bible-toting, gun-carrying, whatever, or, or bean-eating Mexicans, that whatever, whoever they are, they, they're not like us. And that is the problem. If we accept that hard work and 
talent are going to allow you to succeed, and if we fail to recognize that the, that, that belief has created a game that is rigged, then both sides are going to continue to grow apart in self-rage, scapegoating rage, and disdain. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's all. Okay. I guess so. Okay. Let's try next. Okay. So the, the argument here is Again, the, the, the notion of meritocracy makes all the sense in the world when we just look at it in a photograph. We just look at, at, at a snapshot of it and say, of course, Marty should get the job. He worked harder and he's smarter, right? The, that makes all the sense in the world. And that looks like fair play. What we don't know or we don't remember is that aristocrats thought that for 500 years. They thought that they were morally superior because their children could uh, sip a cup of tea, or went to church more often, or whatever it was that they did, or knew how to dress, or as my daughter said when she was 13, had a great fashion sense. Um, but whatever it was that, that segregated or separated them, you know, um, that they don't talk stupid, or that they don't use slang, they believed that that made them higher, right? Meritocracy is based on, on this idea, but does it really make sense? for me to make 200 times what you make. Because I can operate a technology that was developed for people who, who, uh, who went to my kind of school to take jobs away from people who went to your kind of school. Is that, is that actual? And even if that were the truth, would it be the whole truth? And that is, the problem with meritocracy is that it never looks at the common good, and that is, what is the good of the community, you know? So, it's, you have four children. One of them is a math genius. One of them is a ballet dancer. One of them has cerebral palsy. And one of them is just Dennis the Menace, okay? And you have $100,000 you can spend on their training and education. Now, it's absolutely true that the math genius gets up at 2 o'clock in the morning and works harder than any of his four siblings, or, or her four siblings, three siblings. And it's absolutely true that, that they uh, are, you know, that they're smarter than them, okay? Do you give them the money? You also have a child with cerebral palsy. And that the money that you spend on that child with cerebral palsy is never going to produce a genius. That's not going to happen. The money that you spend on the dancer, the odds that he's going to be Nuria are relatively thin. This is for his entertainment. And honestly, Dennis the Menace is just happy to go see Mr. Wilson every day. Right? <laughs> but really, you look at that question differently when you're a parent than when you just look at it as individuals. You try to ask yourself, what about this community, this family? You know. So, I will give them some more money to the mathematician if he agrees that when he grows up, he will take financial responsibility for taking care of the child with cerebral palsy, you know? That is, he'll pay some taxes or some cover on that, you know? Um, so, or, I, I'll make some decisions, but I'm not going to make an automatic judgment that I'm going to go for the kid who works the hardest and has the most talent. That's, that's not what I'm going to do if I'm looking at the community. So if we're paying attention to the common good, we're going to come up with very different answers than the meritocracy answer. But even if we weren't looking at the common good, if we're looking at the intergenerational way in which the game is played, then we're going to have, we're going to, have to put something in the, into the game so that in each generation there are corrections so that um, the people uh, advancing in the game uh, will redistribute talent or at least make it accessible. It was great. In 1956, when the kid from Kansas, who later wins a, a prize, a Nobel Prize for economics, gets to go to Harvard for the first time, that was great. But Harvard today has a greater concentration of wealthy students. Harvard and Yale today have greater economic inequality in their student body than Cambridge or Oxford. So it's not great now. All right. So 
I'm suggesting that there are deep and significant flaws even in the idea of meritocracy, um, but there also are flaws in the, in the system once it starts working. And that these flaws are covered up by the fact that education creates different kinds of people, and then jobs create different kinds of opportunities, and then the education and the jobs go together to make sure that the sorting out um, reinforces itself over and over again. Okay. All right. To most Americans on the left, on the right, blue and red Americans, share a unique and deep faith in reliance on individual effort and rejection of government aid. Both on the right and the center left have unquestionably embraced meritocracy. In the 1930s and the 1960s, the progressive left in this country saw an economic divide between the rich and the poor, and they attempted to address that divide with the New Deal and the war on poverty. But after the 1970s, no center-right or center-left politician of any standard has attempted to overcome or address this gap. Instead, they have attempted to build bridges over the gap so that some people could get over it. And they've offered themselves as models. Barack and Michelle Obama are classic models of this. People who come from medium, uh, you know, the, the middle class of the country, and then get to great power and success. Okay? The Clintons are examples of this. They, they show this. In the United States and the United Kingdom, the notion of progressives who wanted to bridge, who wanted to, to um, shrink the gap has been abandoned. That commitment's been abandoned, and now they're not addressing the gap, they're letting the gap grow, and then they're trying to build a bridge over it. And what I'm suggesting is, a bridge that has fewer and fewer, I know I keep mixing the metaphors, but a bridge that's also a ladder that has fewer and fewer rungs and that's narrower and narrower becomes increasingly like a lottery game, right? And a lottery game that's rigged against us. And unless we address the lottery game, we're not going to solve the problem, right? America, along with having this deep and unique faith in hard work and individual effort, is also the most religious and Christian developed nation in the world. That is, there are more people in this country at the present time who identify as religious or Christian than in any other developed nation in the world. So here we are. We have the great, what's our greatest faith? Individual effort, and we're also the most religious. I, I'm going to suggest that there's a tension between these two, and that in practice, when we have to choose between our belief in meritocracy and our belief in our religious views, religious views, Get pushed to the side. This will, and that's why I called it idolatrous. Because if it trumps your religious beliefs, then it's an idol for you. Okay, all right. So I'm going to look just at three, um, no, two. I'm going to look at two, because I know I was going to be too chatty. Okay, I'm going to look at two visions. Yeah, can we get that next one? Okay. If we look at the biblical text, if we look at the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament, we see two meta narratives, two massive stories. Okay. One story is the Exodus narrative that we see at the end of Genesis, throughout Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and in Joshua and Judges. And that's the promised land story. And that's the Moses story. And we've talked about this before here. Uh, and the other meta narrative is in the four Gospels, and that appears in the four Gospels, and has echoes in the epistles of Paul in his notion of the body of Christ. And that's the kingdom of God story. What I want to say is that both of these narratives, the promised land story under Moses and the, um, the uh, uh, kingdom of God story under Jesus, are both in uh, response to the pyramids of wealth that existed in the ancient world under advanced agricultural empires, where there was a Caesar or a pharaoh or a king and a very small ruling class that was made up of just about the same proportion of wealthy people as we currently have in the United States. Okay. Uh, and and, and uh, administered by a small retainer class, okay, that together made up about the top 10% of the population, and that governed the 90% of the peasants and slaves. And this was true uh, for Moses um, a thousand years before Jesus, and for Jesus 2,000 years before us. And that in these narratives, in the Promised Land narrative and in the um, uh, Reign of God narrative, the biblical accounts, they 
they, they do similar things. So the promised land opposes Pharaoh's advanced agricultural empires, concentration of wealth and power in the ruling and retainer class, uh, and, which, and the Pharaoh does this through laws that strip family farmers of their wealth, their livestock, their land, their liberty, and uses the demagoguery, uh, uh, scapegoating uh, immigrants. Read chapter 1 of Exodus, and you will know where populist and natives um, politicians have gotten their speech. Okay, that, in that speech, the Pharaoh uh, tells um, the Canaanites and the uh, Egyptians that the trouble is not that he's stolen 90% of everything in the country. The trouble is these foreigners, the Hebrews, have come in and they're threatening them and that they're sexually dangerous. So it's kind of like if you put um, the Mexican threat and the transgender threat together, um, that's what this speech is about. And, and it's, it's prescient. Okay? Um, to dismantle this aristocracy, the Hebrews need to repent of their idolatrous faith in the empire, and they have to adopt new economies of agriculture, labor, land, and politics, and this takes them about 40 years to do. Okay? So that's the Exodus story. In the New Testament, the kingdom of God opposes Caesar, Herod, and the high priest advanced agricultural empires, concentration of wealth and power, through occupation taxes and tithes, and purity laws that scapegoat women and the poor and the strangers. Um, Jesus' religious contemporaries would have, no, would have understood very well um, many of our own religious contemporaries um, who think that the most important thing uh, that we need to fight about right now is whether or not um, uh, trans people get to get into bathrooms, all right? Um, so that, that, they would understand that fight, okay? Now, to dismantle the kingdoms of the world, Jesus uses parables, creative resistance, and radical table fellowship to undercover and resist, uncover and resist the lives of the empire. What I'm suggesting here is that in both of the major testaments of our scriptures, we see that central narratives hold up as the, not as villains, but as injustices which must be addressed, structural injustices, the concentration of wealth and power in the hands of few, which is the result of actual practices and policies which have been put into place and suggest that we must engage in a long-term struggle to dismantle these practices. And then we see this both in the Hebrew scriptures and in the Christian scriptures. So, both the promised land and the kingdom of God oppose and unmask self-justifying aristocracies. And our meritocracy is a self-justifying aristocracy of wealth and power concentrated in the hands of the few. Both the promised land and the kingdom of God narratives unmask the processes by which self-justifying aristocracies arise and perpetuate themselves and gain a stranglehold on the minds and the lives of the rest. And, and um, so they, they, they unmask it. Jesus uses parables. Um, uh, yeah. And both the Promised Land and the Kingdom of God narratives recommend a series of structural changes over time to address the underlying injustices. The, um, the sharing of the manna in the desert teaches the Hebrews uh, to uh, practice agriculture in a way different from the hoarding of the empire, uh, the building of the, um, of the um, Ark of the Covenant um, by shared labor in Exodus teaches them to work differently than slaves and serfs under the Pharaoh. Um, so they teach them different practices. And both the Promised Land and the Kingdom of God offer visions not of individual success, but of the common good. Right? What's the definition of the Promised Land? It is a country in which there will be no poor and everyone will have enough, and no one will have too much. It's a very different vision. All right. um, and as a fair sharing of economic and political power protected by structures and practices that must be constantly repaired and reformed. So, dismantling, oh God, I get uh, There's a typo. And that was supposed to be a meritocracy. First of all, we need to recognize that meritocracy is not the only way and that we can't choose another path. Meritocracy, addressing meritocracy will not be easy or a first with them. There is no easy answer to this. I've got a couple of things I'm going to show you, but there, there isn't any simple solution that's going to take this thing away. All right? Getting to our present state took 50 years. And it will take a while to undo this, but we have done it before. We have undone this before, okay? It will require changing attitudes, values, and customs. But all these things were changed to make room for meritocracy's rights. And that is, meritocracy didn't just happen. A 
elite schools decided to develop the SATs and decided to take these students. Okay? Businesses decided to abandon training inside the corporations. The government decided to change tax structures so as to encourage companies to hire more Dianes and fewer mid rent bankers. Those things can be changed. Right? They take work, but they could be changed. In the 1930s, America faced an economic divide equal to our own, and in the decades that followed, American reforms overcame that divide largely and created a broadly democratic middle class. It has been done before. Our grandparents did it. We could do it. Right. Next. Uh, yeah. Okay. Other countries do it as well. I said before, Germany has done it, uh, you know, countries like Norway, Canada, Italy, and Sweden have done it. So this is a possible thing. We, we cannot um, succumb to despair here, which is another faith issue, honestly, for us. Okay, yeah, next. Wow, I just put that completely out. I wonder how I did that. Yeah, you did, you did just get that. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, go back. Yeah, so here's the thing. Here's some, here's some little things that could actually be done. First, we could get rid of the charitable tax deduction for universities unless they admit half their incoming students from the bottom two-thirds of the American economy. Okay? And that is, right now, about 70% of the student body comes from the top fifth. So, there are enough smart kids in the bottom two-thirds of America's economy who could very easily succeed at Harvard. So, just, just half, okay? And, and they could do that easily because they have endowments that would blow your mind, and they could double their enrollment without thinking. So they could absolutely do that. So you want the tax credit? Fine. Start educating people from the bottom of two-thirds. So that would be an easy thing. We need to shift uh, and end the tax deduction for any donation to these schools, which allows the middle class to pay for the education of the rich. Okay, so that's, that's one thing that we could do. All right, do the... And then on the, on the job side, we are the country that pays more on college education than any other country in the world. And we are the country that pays the least on job training for people who lose their jobs. That's a fixable thing. That's because much of the money we spend on education comes from our federal government and our states. We could just move that money slightly over. We started spending money on retraining people for mid-level jobs. We could make a significant difference. We could change the tax structure so that banks would be incentivized to hire more middle manager bank loan officers and fewer algorithm officers. So we could do that. And the banks would still make lots of money. Uh, this is bad we to talk about that, but anyway. <laughs> still, we could also reform the payroll tax to make it less regressive. And that, is, um, so that, so that, um, and we can take the money from the reform of a progressive payroll tax um, to um, uh, to divert it into job training and into education. Right? And um, we could shift the Social Security tax so that um, people, uh, wealthy people, pay Social Security tax on their entire income. If we did that, instead of raising, so in France they just decided they're going to raise. Um, the age of Social Security, uh, to, uh, two more years, right? So they're going to do that. But the truth is, a lot of people uh, in the uh, working slash middle class who don't have college degrees use their bodies for work, right? And those bodies wear out. And, and by 65, those bodies are using a lot of oxycodone, right? So adding another two or three years of that is not as good an idea as why not tax the people who are making millions of dollars just continue their social security tax. So those are things that we could do. We could make those kinds of changes. This will not solve the problem, but they would be steps in that direction. Okay. So we made meritocracy, we can unmake it. Between the 30s and the 70s, human action on many levels and in various places created the Great Compression. Okay, so human beings did that. Um, and it gave us our middle class and it cut the poverty rate in half and reversed a long trend of economic inequalities. Since the 70s, other human actions, government policies, university policies, have created our meritocracy and all its ills. But other advanced democracies chose other paths, 
So meritocracy can be dismantled and other paths chosen, though it will take time and effort. Meritocracy hurts both the rich and the rice. Again, I get it, you don't know why I boo boo for this, for the rich, but it does actually hurt them too. We have common ground in dismantling it if we can recognize and address its ills and not fall for fake solutions. Our biblical faith offers us visions of the common good, uncovering the ills, workings, and possible solutions to meritocracy's strength. Okay, that's it. Ben. <laughs> Chose to do that. Okay, it's time for if you have some questions, sure. um, and you uh, and you're free you want to stay around. Yeah, I'm happy to answer. Yeah. yeah. One other thing that that I have observed in the rich versus yeah. the middle class is that there's more mentorship, so that the people who are working hard, the kids who yeah. grow up, up yeah. see people who are successful. Right. right. And in the middle class, you don't see the same. Possibility. Absolutely. And don't see as many. So that's right. If more people can be mentors, then absolutely, absolutely. And so they they get saturated with training in so many different ways. Yes. You mentioned the McEnroe brothers. Yeah. Athletics and entertainment yeah. does provide another avenue to uh, enter the elite with right. a fabulous salary. Right. So, uh, how does that fit into your picture? Right, it does. It's it's a you know it's kind of like a it's a it's a margin option. So like, um, if you took all of the black uh, super rich CEOs in America and put them on one uh, scale, and you took all of the black um, uh, uh, wealthy athletes and put them on the other end of the scale, that black athlete would be shot. Uh, would I mean the black CEO would be shot to the moon, right? And that is, it is, it is more of an opportunity uh, for um, people from poor situations right now in entertainment. The problem is that both, um, both athletics and um, uh, entertainment are also winner-take-all societies that have stripped out the middle uh, players. So, for example, uh, I've been at Gonzaga for almost 30 years, and um, the last time Gonzaga had somebody who made a career of professional basketball, uh, well, uh, yeah, he, he wouldn't wear a mask at games, and so we don't talk about him. <laughs> but it's been, it's, it's been 45 years. Now, and we have good teams. Um, you know, every year we have good teams, and we have good players, um, and we get in the national press, but those lads, and now our lasses, they, um, they don't actually become, because it is such a pyramid. So very, very, very few people get to the top. And uh, the other piece I would say about athletics is, we live in a country where 10 million people watch 10 people play a game. Um, and that's different from having um, 10 million people play games themselves. Do you know what I mean? So, so there, it has a, a number of deleterious sort of effects. With entertainment, the same kind of thing is true. Um, we have a handful of people who are recognized at the top of the game. So, God, um, some my brothers. Who's the who's the who's the um, the rock and roll guy from Jersey? Um, Bruce. Bruce. Okay. So Bruce. There are many of us in the room of an age who remember Bruce. And uh, my brother uh, recently went to one of his concerts, which you know cost an astronomical amount of money. And Bruce is, I think he's 67 or something like that. I, I forget what he is at the present time. He's, he's way north of 30, which we once said we would never trust anybody over, right? Um, and he's making a phenomenal amount of money. And I don't, I don't dislike Bruce, but nobody should think that, that he sings at 67 or 70 as well as, as he sang at, at you know, 30, right? Um, so why is he getting all this phenomenal amount of money? And why are a lot of musicians who are like, who are actually better than he is now, but who, at his prime, he was only about 1% better than they were. Why is the gap between him and them so great? So the winner-take-all theory, is a, I'm suggesting, is a bad theory, period. Um, but you're right, Bruce didn't have to go to MIT to get where he is. It's not the only path, but it is the primary engine for people who are 
And I bet if Bruce is smart, he's using his money to make sure his kids get a good education because he knows what the odds are of being a rock and roll star. And so, anyway, that's what I would. Just my initial thoughts. Uh, athletes and entertainment, they're such a tiny, <coughs> tiny percent. Right. I mean, they're just an outlier. Right. That's not available to 99.8% of people. Right. Well, that's uh, what Marty says, because he's born into it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and then you have a so many different ways yeah. that I'm able to pass on way more of my wealth, percentage of my wealth, yeah. than people yeah. making yeah. fifty thousand. Yeah. I mean, it's great. Yeah. But we'll get to you when we get home. Oh yeah. Believe <laughs> <laughs> me, I'm not exceptional at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for your patience. I I had some real qualms about this because I knew I had more stuff than I had time for. So thank you for hanging on. Oh. <laughs> so David, do you have the slides? I do. Okay, so you can distribute them. Or... Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I'm going to run out.